All right, you hear me now? Mic check, mic check. Do you see me? You see me too, and you hear me? All right, shalom, 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 everybody. Uh, I'm still getting used to this live streaming. <sighs> live streaming lessons and casting my screen, so bear with me. I believe this is how I want to do it. No, that isn't how I want to do it. Okay, we're gonna give me just a moment. And then we'll open up with prayer. How do you play it? Oh, okay. Do we? All right. Shalom, 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 shalom. Mike's still good. All right, let's open up with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you've allowed us to come together. And in this case, we're not um, really doing a Bible lesson. We're going to deal with some history, but we still want to give you glory and give you honor and honor you in all that we do. And we pray, Father God, that this uh, information will be insightful and that it will give people knowledge and understanding. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. All right. So the title of this lesson is Refuting Dane Calloway. Proof the transatlantic slave trade happened. And the and the American Negro is not Native American. Excuse me for the burp. Okay, I'm gonna repeat the title again, okay? Refuting Dane Calloway, proof the transatlantic slave trade happened, and the American Negro is not Native American. Okay, one more time, mic check is good. All right, so moving straight along, the objective of this lesson is, in this brief lesson, we will demonstrate with primary sources from my own ancestors, Keon from my own ancestors, and others that Dane Calloway's assertions are false. The transatlantic slave trade indeed happened, and the so-called American Negro is neither Native American or indigenous to the United States. He proclaims to be, and I put this in quotations, and the only reason why we're why, only reason I'm not going in on a person, I'm just doing this because I get messages from people who are. Have you checked out Dane Calloway's stuff? Have you checked out his stuff? What do you think about what he's saying? What about this? What about that? And I've looked at a couple of stuff and I was like, this is nonsense. OK, and so I get tired of getting messaged about it. I get tired of people asking me questions about this because I'm like, this is what he's saying makes it doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. And we're going to get in and we're going to get into that. The other reason being is our people. And when I'm talking about our people, I'm talking about African-Americans here in the United States. We have a lack of knowledge. We don't know who we are. We don't know where we came from. And because we don't know who we are and we don't know where we came from, we get people from our own from amongst our own people who exploit that for monetary gain and all kinds of stuff. If you've noticed on our page, like we take donations for our church to build stuff up for the church, but you never hear me on here asking y'all for money. I don't, I don't do that. I don't have Patron, I don't have a Patron account or Patreon, whatever it's called. I don't have that. It, any of my lessons, like when it comes to our Bible lessons and our Sabbath class and the stuff we do for our church, always free, right? But you have these people on here who are trying to make money off of exploiting our people, okay? And because our people don't know who they are. And so what they'll do is they'll come up with these grandish ideas. And because our people don't know who they are, they latch on to it because they're like, oh, see, we have a history now. I like hearing that. It's grandiose stories, okay? So we're going to deal with this. All right. So back to the objective. All right. He claims to, this is from his own, uh, from his own page and website. I am an author, an unorthodox historic researcher. All right. So he just said unorthodox. You don't want to be unorthodox. All right. Unorthodox historic researcher, unconventional journalist, film editor and producer that share. And when it's film editor and producer means he makes those documentaries that I tell my church followers, third eye documentaries that are not. You got to list sources. OK. Just because somebody puts out a doc, uh, you know, puts out a documentary on YouTube 
and it has music in the background and all this stuff to you know to spook you out and it takes a couple quotes from here and a couple quotes from there and they put it up on the screen if they're not telling you where the sources are from and if they're not telling you their educational background what makes them valid to be an expert on the subject right these are just things you need to think about that's why you usually and I put my educational background on here so that you know I can that I'm a valid source. Also, besides putting my educational background on here, when I do history lessons, I give you all of the sources. Okay. For the most part, so if you want to, you you can use the stuff I'm giving you. If you were in a college course in history and you wanted to make a and you wanted to use my information for your thesis, you could. Okay, you could argue stuff based off of what I'm saying if you wanted to in a college or an academic environment, because I give you the sources and then I give you my own educational background, okay? For the most part, I wanna to speak to my people here. You cannot use YouTube documentaries as a reliable source, nine times out of 10, you can't, okay? All right, so anyways, he says, I'm an author and unorthodox historic researcher, unconventional journalist, film editor and producer, that shares knowledge that shares knowledge of serpentuous surpi information, providing unembellished truths that is generally not mentioned and are known to the public. All right. So then I put in here an objective. I am an orthodox and classically trained historical research researcher. I received my bachelor's degree in history with a minor in Africana studies from California State University, Dominguez Hills. And I did my graduate studies in social science education at Mississippi State University. Also, for the record, my maternal grandma was Choctaw. Okay. And when I say Choctaw, she was actual Choctaw. Her daddy was full blooded Choctaw. Okay. He had copper skin, long black hair, and his long black hair was straight. Okay. And a pointy, and he had a pointy nose. He had copper skin. And my maternal and my paternal grandma was Blackfoot Cherokee. What is Blackfoot Cherokee? Those are the people who you might as well say triracial. She had a mixture in her of French, Scotch, Irish, African, okay, and Cherokee. All right, these were the people who during colonial times, before they passed the black codes, were intermingling and marrying amongst the whites and producing offspring, and then in some admixture with the Native Americans. And when the black codes were passed, instead of them wanting, they didn't want to be classified as black because that would have made them a lower class citizen. So they started saying things like, I'm Blackfoot Cherokee. Oh, we're Portuguese. Uh, in Florida, I think there was a group, they called themselves Dominicans. Um, I'm trying to think of another name, another uh, thing they went by. But anyways, you get the point. So a lot of these Native American, these so-called Native American groups that you see on the East Coast, that and most of them have not been recognized by the federal government as being actual Native Americans. In some cases, some of the states have recognized them, but the federal government hasn't recognized them. And they look black. That's what these people are. They're people who either slaves who ran away from the plantation and intermingled with the Native Americans, or they're people who before and intermingled with whites and stuff too, or else they're people from during the colonial era. That's where their ancestry comes from. And they intermingled with Africans, African slaves or Af at the time, African indentured servants, white indentured servants and Native Americans. OK, they're not full blooded Native Americans. My grandma, my grandma was Choctaw. She was Choctaw. OK. All right. Let's go. Let's move on now. Let's get some biblical precepts before we get into the historical facts. OK. So we're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse four. Thou even thyself shall discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee. This is God speaking to the Israelites. OK, and he says, and thou even thyself shall discontinue from thine heritage, meaning the Israelites will lose their heritage that I gave thee. So the heritage that the most high gave the Israelites. OK, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in a land which thou knowest not. What does it mean here when it says, I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in a land which thou knowest not? It means you're going to go into slavery. And when you go into slavery, you're going to serve your enemies. And where are you going to go into slavery? Lands in which you know not. Lands like America, lands like uh, Brazil, lands like Jamaica, lands like uh, Southeast Asia, lands like the Pacific Islands. I'm just naming some. All the places our people have been scattered, scattered to on this globe, okay? 
And that's not to say that we didn't have knowledge of the Americas. We had kingdoms that had sailors that sailed over here. I've talked about that before. Even the fact that um, the the Portuguese and the Spanish had American corn in the in the Iberian Peninsula before, and this is documented before Columbus even sailed to the Americas. And the Portuguese and the Spanish said that they got them from the Moors, and the Moors told them that they got them from West Africa along the Niger River Delta. That there were kingdoms there that were growing corn that they had brought back from the Americas. So not that when it says here that a land that you did not know, meaning a land that you're not from, okay? And even then, back at that time, most of the regular people living in these West African kingdoms, um, the regular common people wouldn't have had knowledge of the Americas like that. That would have been the sailors and the people and, you know, the rulers of the kingdoms, okay? All right, so I'll start back over. And thou, even thyself, shall discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in a land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. All right. So because we disobeyed the most high, he sent us into captivity. All right. Exodus chapter 19 and verse six. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. OK, so this was our heritage that we lost. How we just read in Jeremiah 17 and verse four that we will lose our heritage or be discontinued from our heritage. What was our heritage as a people? Our heritage as a people was to be a kingdom of priests or a nation of priests, a holy nation. What does that mean? It was our job to keep the commandments and teach the other nations how to keep the commandments and serve God. But we didn't do that. That's why now you have Islam coming out of Muhammad and the Ishmaelites and, and the Arabs. This is why you have Sunday Roman Christianity coming from the Gentiles, the Europeans, right? All of this is twisting things from the, from the original people's religion, okay? Which the original people's religion was the Israelites. And it was our job to teach the other nations properly how to serve God and we dropped the ball, okay? Hosea chapter four and verse six, my people are destroyed for what? A lack of knowledge. And that's why I'm doing this lesson because I see this cat, this Jake, and he puts these videos out and people, and I don't care about views ever, but I care about views in the context of this because it's misleading my people, okay? I see things where people want me to look at videos he have. I look at it for a second because I don't want to, the knowledge is ridiculous on there. Like he doesn't know what he's talking about. And I look at it and I'm like, this has a quarter of a million views. This has 50,000 views. This has 100,000 views. And you're misleading our people, okay? So when it says here, lock it. All right. Anyway, so that when it says, uh, when it says here, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. All right. It's talking about how the Israelites are destroyed for their lack of knowledge. And that key knowledge is lack of lack of knowledge of self. OK, so it says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge. And our people do do that. We reject knowledge. We have an aversion to knowledge. When you come and try to kick knowledge to our people, most of us don't want to hear it. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. So because we rejected knowledge, we lost our heritage. And what was our heritage again? To be a nation of priests, okay? Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children, okay? So the so-called American Negro is vanquished because he has no knowledge of self. People like Dane Calloway and others who are supposed to teach us instead mislead us for profit, okay? Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 10. Many pastors, and you can replace pastors with teachers, many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant, my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. So who have destroyed the children of Israel? Our leaders, our pastors, our teachers. And how have they done that? By feeding us misinformation. And just to prove to you here that in the Bible, when it's referring to this vineyard, it's referring to the children of Israel, Isaiah chapter five and verse seven. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. All right. So we're going to read. Now, this is the primary source. OK, so many times I've read from my uh, and also happy Feast of Unleavened Bread is the week of Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. So happy Feast of Unleavened Bread week. OK, 
uh, for our lesson for the first day of Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yesterday, I read my great great grandmother's slave narrative. For the purposes of this, just to show you how ridiculous the things Dane Calloway is saying is, I'm going to read from my great great uncle's slave narrative. Okay, so this is my great great grandmother's brother's slave narrative. Okay. Here's the source information if you want to look it up because Dane Calloway is always talking about the sources, the sources, you know, bring it, bring that out. I need the primary sources, the primary sources. Well, this is the primary source. This is from my direct ancestry. Deal with it. Okay. So this is from the County of Amity and Pike title, Mississippi slave narratives from the WPA records interviewer, Mrs. Holmes transcribed by Ann Ellen Jedigan. I'm butchering that. Mississippi narratives prepared by the Federal Writers Project of the Works Progress Administration for the state of Mississippi. Okay. All right. So this is the Reverend James W. Washington, my great great uncle. He says, My name is James W. Washington. I is a minister of the Holy Writ. And I'm going to read it exactly how it's written so that you know it's in that old Negro English so that we know this is a primary source. Okay. All right. I found it. I found it because another thing he's always saying is like, oh, these people need to do that. Do your own research. And what you'll find is you didn't really you didn't really come from Africa like that. And there wasn't these slave ships like that and all that. Oh, OK, well, I have done my research. OK, I know my family history. So I'm going to bring this out. I found at this flowery Mount Baptist Church and pastored it for 20 years. And I can't see any comments because I'm not on the thing. So you you monitor that. Cause you know, the cuckoo birds might come out. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. All right. I, as a minister of the Holy Writ, I founded this flowery Mount Baptist church and pastored it for 20 years. I preached all over the country. I was born. So I was told in July, 1854 and was a big strapping lad when free. My mammy, my mammy was named Martha Felder. She belonged. She belonged to Dr. Charles Felder. And he had a big fine house on the road from Liberty to Magnolia. Liberty is in Amity County, Magnolia is in Pike County. I still got family and I got an auntie that lives in Amity County. And I still got a boatload of family that lives near Magnolia in Pike County with land. Okay. You can even Google it because if you look, it's an unincorporated part of the county. And if you look at it, there's a, if you, it's the road is called Irene Road. And if you look at Irene Road on Google, you're going to see an offshoot called Miller's Road. Why is it called Miller's Road? Because that's where that's my mom's maiden name was Miller. OK, and all my family live over there. And so that's where they at. OK, they've been there since the slave plantation days. OK, and for a side note, I'm just dealing with this slave narrative. But on my dad's side, uh, y'all can look up the Prospect Hill Plantation. Google Isaac, Google Captain Isaac Ross. OK. And uh, and it should come up in the Wikipedia article, come up with the planter. He, there's also a book called Mississippi in Africa. That's my dad's ancestry line. OK, they were also slaves brought over from Africa, originally purchased in South Carolina. Isaac Ross fought in the Revolutionary War. Some of the people, uh, some of his slaves fought with him. OK, and he freed them afterwards, some of them. But when he moved to Mississippi, they traveled with him to Mississippi to where Jefferson County is now. And then he promised to set them free. When he died, he put it in his will and that they should be set free and sent back to Liberia. When he died, his children didn't want to really set them free. So it was a long court case. And I'm paraphrasing, you can look all this stuff up. It was a long court case in Mississippi. And my ancestors got tired of waiting. So they burnt down the plantation. Eventually, thank God, the case was won. And so the ones who decided to go back to Liberia, who wanted to go to Liberia did. OK, my great great grandfather decided not to. His dad did go back to Liberia. All right. So they even have a town. My surname is Ross, obviously, because the masters was Isaac Ross. Right. So there is even a town outside of Greenville, Liberia. And why is it called Greenville, Liberia? Because most of the people who settled there came from Mississippi, right? And else, yeah, and there's a Greenville, Mississippi near where my wife's family's from on her mom's side, okay? Anyways, 
and they set up a little village called Rossville. All right. Like I said, for people, these people come on here with these third eye documentaries and then and gullible people fall for the stuff because you don't pe our people refuse to read. You got to do research for yourself and stop letting these people come on here and mislead us with gullible and misleading the gullible with misinformation. OK, same thing with all these conspiracy theories. Our people get in their text messages and your emails and on Facebook, uh, YG and Carrie Hilson said, you know, coronavirus is linked to 5G in your phone. All this, we got to stop this nonsense, okay? We really do, as a people, we got to stop this nonsense. All right, back to the matter at hand. My mammy was named, my mammy was named Martha Felder. She belonged to Dr. Charles Felder, and he had a big fine house on the road from Liberty to Magnolia, about 12 miles west of Magnolia. That was a big fine house, but it is burnt down now. It cost about 10,000, maybe more. Dr. Felder had lots and lots of slaves. I don't know how many my mammy had. I don't know how many. My mammy had 12 chillings. Harriet, that's, his, that's my great, great grandmother. Matilda, George, Frank, Sarah, Wilfred, Delia, Mary, Willie, Celia, Charlie, and me. Not all of us had the same pappy. My pappy was named William Rayborn Washington. I don't know what become of him, except he was carried off. Dr. Felder come by him through his second wife. She brung him lots of slaves. And when, and when her oldest boy married, she gave my pappy to him and was, excuse me, and was carried down in the lowlands near Mobile, referring to Mobile, Alabama. I remember what I read in the Bible. If I didn't, I couldn't preach. I come from a long lifestyle. My mammy was 112 years old when she died. I don't call my I don't call myself old. My grandmammy on my pappy's side of the house lived to be 132 years old. She di she died down here close to Magnolia near the bridge that crosses the Tangipo River. And that's still where my family is over there by the Tangipo. And I wouldn't call it a river, but you know, a creek. But if you come from a big city like New York or LA or Chicago, then you would call it a river. All right. Her master was named Mr. Sandal. Now, this is where we get into refuting Dane Calloway's nonsense with the primary source. OK. Now, where is my great great uncle going to say that his ancestors came from? Let's pay attention and let's see. Let's see if they if he says they come from Africa and let's see if he says they got here on slave ships. And what you're also going to find out is if we're really Native Americans, too, then how come my great great uncle is saying that they were going to sell her to some Native Americans, okay? Because they're not the same people, all right? Let's keep reading here. She was born in Madagascar on the coast of Mozambique Channel, all right? And this is why I'm going to digress a lot in this. This is why I've been telling the people who, that, who follow us, our church, research your own family history. Oh, but Brother Lanny, I got stuck here. Well, keep researching. It might take you, you know how long it took me to put this together? Like to find, I'm not to find out my family history. I started looking at it when I was 18. Okay. I didn't get 50% of the information I had till I was in my senior year of college when I was like 24. Okay. Then I didn't even find out the stuff. I didn't even find out the stuff about uh, Prospect Hill Plantation and Isaac Ross till I was 30. And I'm still learning stuff. So you just got to keep doing the research and find out for yourself. They're lying to you when they tell you, oh, there's, there's no record of your history. No, there's record of your history. They just make it difficult to find. And they know that black people don't like to read. If you want to hide something from us, what do you do? You put it in a book. Okay. So you're going to have to read and do research. All right. And nobody can hold your hand and do it for you. You got to do it yourself. Because I get people all the time too. Will you do this for me? Yeah, I'll look up some stuff for you, but I can't babysit it for you. You're going to have to do it yourself. All right. He says here, she was born in Madagascar, okay? That's an island in Africa on the coast of Mozambique Channel. She was captured and put in a French vessel. So she was captured and put on a French slave ship and landed on the coast of Maine, referring to the United States. They told her they was going to give her to an Indian for a wife. So they told her that they were going to sell her to a Native American to be a wife. But Dane Calloway will tell you things, crazy things, like there wasn't slave ships. 
or the native, we really were native Americans. And then they sent the native Americans to Africa. Then they brought the native Americans back here. Okay. Anyways. So as you see here, she was going to be sold to a native American. All right. And like I told you, my grandma is Choctaw and never at one time have I ever been told or ever that, oh, you see the Choctaw and the Negro slaves were the same. No, they weren't. Okay. All right. They told her they was going to give her to an Indian for a wife. But instead of that, they brung her south and sold her. She smoked a clay pipe. She was black and she could conjure folks. Conjure means she doing that ooga booga African religion stuff. Okay. She could put spells on them and she had 13 chillings. Next, my great grandmammy on my mammy's side of the house come from where? Congo Free States in Africa. She was captured. With who? With a lot of Africans, not a lot of Native Americans, a lot of Africans, and brought where? And brung to New Orleans and sold for slaves. Mr. Abner O'Neill in Amity County brought, bought her and gave her to Adam O'Neill for a wife. Because back then, at the time, the, uh, Abner O'Neill and Adam O'Neill were some of the pioneers of the Natchez District in Southwest Mississippi, and there wasn't a lot of European women down there, so the uh, white men were marrying Native Americans and African slaves. And when I say marry, they weren't really officially marrying them. They were just common law, you know, basically just banging them. And they lived in a house with them. When more white women came down to Southwest Mississippi, he got rid of my, uh, he got rid of my ancestor and he married a white woman. Okay. Her son, another Adam and his wife, Dinah was my grandpappy and mammy. All right. See how quickly and easy that was to dispel the nonsense that were native that the american negro is native americans and that the american negro didn't come over here on slave ships i just gave you primary sources from my own ancestry now we're going to go a little bit deeper all right because we just read from i just read from my great great uncles my great great grandmother's brother's slave narrative right and he talked about how his ancestor came from madagascar on a slave ship all right so let's find out the history of the people in Madagascar that she came from. What are they really? An accurate, this is from an accurate description of Af Africa, an exact description of the African islands. As Madagascar are St. Lawrence, St. Thomas, the Canary Islands, Cape de Verde, Malta, and others by John Ogilvy, 1600 to 1676 AD. There are about 10 or 12 villages inhabited since the French have their abode there. Didn't we read in my, didn't we just to point out that there's no way that my ancestor could have made this up when he did his slave narrative, right? He was a slave, correct? Uh, he was born a slave. Didn't he say that the French captured her, captured his grandma and brought her from Madagascar? All right. And this is written, what we're reading now, this was written by a dude who lived in the 1600s. There are about 10 or 12 villages inhabited since the French have had their abode there, so that the governor of Anton Gill, which used form which used formerly to war against this island continually, dare not come thither for the fear of the French. The whole contains about six hundred inhabitants, which call themselves Zaffir Hebrian, that is, the children of Abraham. The chief commander have to name Ragnasi or Ranasia, the son of Rat Simeon. That is head because only acknowledged by them as head of the stock of Abraham in this land and Madag in this island and Madagascar. The islanders maintain themselves by planting of rice, ignamines, bananas, sugar canes, peas and beans and fishing for whoseites, a sort of fish, which they carry to sell at St. Lawrence, paying to the governor the fifth part of tribute, which also they do of rice and other plants. These islanders will enter into no league with the Christians, yet trade with them because it seems to it seems they have retained somewhat of the ancient Judaism. So here it says the people, the only reason why they traded with the Christian Europeans was because it appeared to them in the Europeans' Christianity that it has similarities to their religion. And what was their religion? Judaism. All right. Now, going on, like I said, I have. I have a million ways I can prove to you 
via my own via my own ancestry with facts then i'm a child of israel this is just one of many okay i can prove it to you on my dad's side i can show you how on my dad's lineage is a con and i can bring up how even the own king of the ashanti said that their people came from jerusalem it's not that difficult all right anyways god said god say they all right so then, now we're going to get into some of the stuff that my ancestors that came from Madagascar believe in, okay? Because you know, also people who try to refute that we're Israelites, they'll try to say, you need to prove a direct link, you know, that that's what they were practicing, right? That's what they were practicing before they came over here on the slave ships. Prove that, and then prove that the slaves were doing that. And I, we've done lessons showing you that that was the sla some of the slaves' religion. They were still keeping these facts, okay? But right now we're gonna see what did my slave ancestors who came from Madagascar, what did they believe and what did they practice before they got before she got here to America? God say they gave four sorts of writings to Noah who embraced the law. The first called Al, the first called al or Al-Quran was for Noah. The second Sarastes for Moses. The third Zambura for David. And the fourth, Al Dinzi for Christ, whom they call Ratisa. All right. Oh, but I thought I thought the black man didn't learn about Jesus to the white man. Hmm. Hmm. They say also that Jesus Christ was sent by God into the world without being begotten by any man, but born by the Virgin Mary, which brought him forth without pain and remained a virgin. Hmm. Calling her. Ramari Ramari Amia. Hmm. And this is why, and the reason I'm saying hmm, because Native Americans are not Israelites, right? And when they pull up these sources, when they try to say, see this explorer, you know, alluded to that the Native Americans might be Israelite. They don't have no records of any Native Americans here already having pre-knowledge of who Jesus was. Do they? No, right? Okay, let's keep going that Christ was a man and God, that he was crucified by the Jews, but that God did not permit that he should die, but would have the body of a malefactor found in his place. They observed the Saturday like the Jews and not the Friday like the Muhammadans, because something that people always try to do, scholars will to try to refute things when they find similarities between Africans and the Hebrews. Sometimes they'll try to say, oh, well, that comes from, that's because the Muslims, taught them that stuff. No, this dude is an Englishman writing in the 1600s based off of his observation. And he just told you that they didn't learn this from the Mohammedans. They don't practice the same thing the Mohammedans practice. They keep Sabbath, okay? If they would take in hand a journey, and if you're gonna ask yourself, how come most of the people in Madagascar now don't practice and believe this stuff? There's still a remnant, but the reason is there's this thing called colonization, right? So they were colonized and brainwashed, just like African-Americans over here have been brainwashed. It wasn't just physical slavery, it was mental slavery. And we're gonna read in Deuteronomy 28, where that's part of the curses, where you're gonna worship gods of wood and stone that you never knew, okay? All right. They observed the Saturday like the Jews and not the Friday like the Mohammedans. If they would take in hand a journey of matter or a matter of consequence, they take counsel of their squills. That is of geomancy, or black art, or rather of ul, which they carry about with them in small boxes. They offer great sacrifices of beasts, called myth mythodi, at the entrance upon new-built houses, at the harvest of their fruits of the field, their wives being with child, at the lusty growing of their plants, the burial of their dead, and marriage. Fast days by them called Ramahana, or Mafhuti, and by the Turks, Ramadan, which they observe with great ceremony, but not in any set months, but now in one and, and then in another. According to the position and order of the year, they circumcise their children with great formality, commonly in May, when it is Friday's year, for by the days of the week they reckon their years, especially the people of Anasi and Matatine. These are region, Anasi is in, south, is in the southeastern portion of Madagascar. For all the other, for all the others circumcised at all times, to the performance whereof come all the friends of the, I'm just gonna say community, an alliance of the child to the circumcision into the town, 
to which the parents bring wine and present an ox or heifer for every infant, but poor people less. That's from page 708. All right. Now this I took from another book. It doesn't matter the book because he's going to give the primary source from here. The idea of ancient Jewish roots in Madagascar goes back to well before Grandier. In the beginning, there was Etienne de Flacourt. In his 1658 work, History de la Grande El de Madagascar, based upon his experiences on the island between 1648 and 1655, the explorer writes, those whom I consider the first to have come to Madagascar are the Zaf Habarim, meaning from the line of Abraham. So out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established, right? So we got two primary sources telling you the same thing, bruh. All right. Inhabitants of St. Marie Island and neighboring regions, as evidenced through their use of circumcision, they have no stain of Mohammedism, no, of neither Muhammad nor his caliphs, and repute its practitioners as kafirs and lawless men. So my ancestors said that the Muslims were lawless men. You know how the Muslims call us kafirs? Because meaning like infidels, non-believers. Well, my ancestors called them kafirs because they didn't keep the commandments and they didn't keep the law, not fully right? The Quran is just a bastardized version of the Bible and the Torah, okay? And Muhammad is just a corrupt prophet. He's not in the line of Muhammad, all right? I mean, he's not in the line of Moses and then he twisted God's scriptures, okay? He claims somehow this illiterate man who didn't know how to read got all these visions from Gabriel and somehow Gabriel, the same person who revealed stuff to people in the Bible, told Muhammad stuff completely different than what's in the Bible, strange all right and then if you're a muslim they teach you that you should accept the books in the bible well common sense should tell you that if the bible came before the quran which should you roll with right the bible i digress as evidence through their use of circumcision they have no stain of muhammadism no of neither muhammad nor his caliphs and repute its practitioners as kafirs and lawless men they refuse to break bread or form alliances with them they celebrate and observe Saturday off often rather than Friday and have names that bear no resemblance to those of Moors. All of this leads me to believe that their ancestors came to this island during the first migration of Jews and that they descend from the most ancient of Israelite families from even before the captivity of Babylon or from those who might have stayed in Egypt around the time of the departure of the children of Israel. They bear names they bear names like Moses, Isaac, Joseph, Jacob, and Noah. All right. We're going to close out with some script. Moses warned the Israelites that if they did not keep Yah's commandments, they would be scattered into all nations via slavery on cargo slave ships, and that they would not return home until Christ's second coming. The prophet Daniel confirmed that these curses were poured out on Israel. So let's look at that. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. And we're just going to read a little bit of it. Okay. Starting at verse one. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. All right, we're going to skip because we're not concerned about the blessings because our people did not keep God's commandments. If we did keep commandments, we would be on top of the world, right? Like the book just told us. But instead, we're on the bottom of the world pretty much everywhere you go on the planet. So let's skip down now to verse. Let's skip down now to verse 14. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. Verse 15, but it shall come to pass that thou will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. 16, cursed shalt thou be in the city and cursed shalt thou be in the field, meaning cursed are you going to be in Detroit and cursed you're going to be in Alabama. Cursed shalt thou, and I'm using America as an example. I'm familiar with our diaspora. We got our people still in Africa. We got our people all over here in the Americas. 
We got our people over there in the Middle East and we got our people in Southeast Asia, Pacific Islands. It's a global diaspora. I recognize that. I'm not trying to leave anybody out, but we just going to deal with America for the purposes of this history lesson. All right. So those are the examples that I'm going to use. Curse shall be thy basket in thy store, meaning your businesses are not going to be successful. Okay. All right. I'm going to skip down because I don't want to read all of these. Do, do, do. We're going to skip down to uh, 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 we'll do 25. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. So basically, we'll use an African example. You're going to go out to fight the European who's trying to colonize you. He used to trade guns with you before he started making automatic guns. Once he started making automatic guns, he decides he's not going to sell them to you or trade with you anymore. He has this bright idea called the Berlin Conference. He divvies up your continent. He decides now I'm going to come take it. You go out to fight him with your spears and your old guns. He has his automatic gun, right? Now you flee from him seven different ways. And now your king has been captured. And where your king at now? He in Jamaica. He in, you know what I'm saying? He's been brought this, he's been brought into slavery wherever he's been brought to. Okay. And I know the Berlin conference was 1884, later in the time of the slave. And uh, we're dealing with the slave trade, but they started implementing some of these things before the Berlin Conference. Okay. All right. Just some learning on your way to learning. All right. Where are we going to next? Let's skip down to, let's skip down to uh, 30. This applies directly to what I just read from my uh, great, great uncle's slave narrative. Thou shalt betroth a wife and another man shall lie with her. All right. So didn't he say that she was bought that Abner O'Neill, Abner O'Neill's father, Adam O'Neill, bought her to be a wife. Right. For his son. She probably had a wife when she was. I mean, she probably had a husband when she was in the Congo. Right. Probably. But now she's been bought and made somebody else's wife. On the plantation, didn't many times we jump the broom. And then, but if Massa decided he wants to sleep with your wife, what you going to do? Nothing. Right? All right. I'm just reading to you what the Bible says about the Israelites and what's going to happen to them and how you identify who they are. Thou shalt betroth the wife and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build an house and thou shalt not dwell therein. So, for example, I mentioned to you earlier about how I this my on my paternal side, my dad's ancestry, was owned by Isaac Ross, right? And I told you how they were supposed to be set free in the will. And after Isaac Ross died, his descendants refused to set them free. They had a long court case. They burnt down the plantation house. Well, the plantation house that they burnt down, they built that house. Did they live in that house? No. Where did they live? In the slave cabins out in the field. Okay, but they built that house. They built the house. They cleared the swamp. Before Isaac Ross even left South Carolina, when the land that he purchased in Southwest uh, Mississippi, because he already had some other family that had moved out here before him, he sent some of my ancestors to Southwest Mississippi and had them clear the swamp and cut down all the trees and dig the ditches and prepare the land all before he moved out there, right? Did they reap any of the benefits of that? No, okay? Thou shalt build a house and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard and shall not gather the grapes thereof. So we plant the, uh, <laughs> didn't Bob Marley. And it's always funny because Gentiles love Bob Marley. They love reggae. And it's always funny to me when I see Gentiles listening to reggae. And I'm like, you realize like, and they like that real reggae too, not the dance all stuff. And I'm like, 75% of the songs you're listening to is referring to black people as the Israelites and talking about how they need to go back to Zion and all of this stuff. And you don't even realize what they're talking about. But remember in Crazy Ball Heads, Bob Marley was like, we plant your corn. Now you look at us with scorn, right? All right, so we plant your corn. We plant your cotton. We plant, and these are all cash crops that these nations over here in the Western Hemisphere got rich off of. If you didn't have these cash crops, these nations would not even exist today. Cotton, sugar cane, tobacco. I could go on, but I'm going to stop. Who planted that? 
And who cultivated it? The slaves. Did the slaves reap any of the benefits of that? No. But the Bible told you this was going to happen, right? And thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. All right. Let's go down now to do, do, do. Oh, this is a good one. 32. Because remember, didn't we read how, didn't I read earlier in my great, great grand uncle's slave narrative that uh, how he said his daddy was sold down to Mobile, Alabama, right? So he lost his father. Let's see what the Bible has to say about that. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thine hand. So you're in Virginia, you're in Kentucky, it's 1850. The Gentiles now have raped the land bare, so it's no longer profitable just to do single cash crops. We need to convert this land to where we can just grow foodstuffs and things. I don't need 50 slaves anymore, right? So what do I decide I'm gonna do? I'm gonna sell half my slaves and I'm gonna sell them down to Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Arkansas, Louisiana, East Texas, where they haven't completely raped the land yet and they're doing the same thing down there, I'm gonna sell them down there. So guess what, Obadiah? I'm selling your son down to Mississippi, but you are gonna stay here, right? These are the things that happened and the Bible told us this was going to happen. All right, where are we at? Where, what else do we wanna pick up here? Oh, the Lord, 36, the Lord shall bring thee and thy king, which thou shalt set over thee, Unto a nation whither thou whither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. So you're gonna bow down to this wooden cross and this weird looking Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes that don't look like nothing the Bible has ever described of Jesus. And you're gonna go to the Middle East in the uh, Indian Ocean slave trade, and in the Arab slave trade, and in the Trans-Saharan slave trade, and they're gonna make you a Muslim, and then they're gonna make you come kiss some stupid stone that they say came from Abraham when he came down to Mecca called the Kaaba. And you're gonna kiss that stone, not realizing that Abraham is actually your father and that you descend from the people that the covenant goes through, Jacob, not Ishmael, Isaac, not Ishmael, but they're gonna brainwash you and have you kiss this stone and make ridiculous pilgrimages, ridiculous pilgrimages to Mecca so that you can kiss some rock. All right, I digress. Let's skip down to verse 67. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were evening, and at the evening thou shalt say, Would God it were morning, for the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. All right, and what does Egypt mean? The house of bondage, right? At least like 10 times in the Torah, it tells you Egypt, the house of bondage, Egypt, the house of bondage. So Egypt for the Israelites represents slavery, just like Babylon for the Israelites represents oppression. Why do you think in reggae, they're always referring to Babylon, chant down Babylon? Why do you think our people, myself included, we all call any type of oppression Babylon? The government is Babylon. The Gentiles are Babylon. The police is Babylon. You feel me? Same thing with Egypt, house of bondage. Okay, now notice what it says here because you don't need to take a ship to go from Israel to Egypt. You can walk. People still walk from Africa to Israel today, okay? And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen. So you're gonna be sold into slavery via cargo slave ships. This is what the Bible said and no man shall buy you. And when it says here, and no man shall buy you, it means no one is going to try to redeem you. Did anybody come from Africa and try to get us? No. For the slaves that went over there in the Arab slave trade too, that went to the Middle East and to India and went to the Southeast Asia and places. Did anybody, did any African send ships to come get you? No. Here's a side note. The Portuguese used to take Koreans and Japanese as slaves. They used to take their women. This is in the 1500s and they used them for sex slaves. Guess what the Koreans and the Japanese did when they found out what the Portuguese were doing? They put a stop to that, right? All right, now let's go to Daniel chapter nine and let's see if this is referring, if this is happening to the Israelites now. And 
And remember, if you read in Deuteronomy chapter 28, if you read the whole chapter, it tells you that them curses will be a sign upon us for how long? Forever. Till Christ comes back. Deuteronomy chapter 9 and, huh? Daniel 9, my bad. Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to pick it up at verse. We'll pick it up at uh, verse 9. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. All right. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven have not been done as have been done upon Jerusalem, as it is written in the law of Moses. He keeps referring to this law of Moses. This is what you will find in Deuteronomy 28. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. All right, now, so these curses have been poured upon us. Let's go to Luke chapter 21. Let's see what Jesus had to say was going to happen to the Israelites. Did Jesus tell you the Israelites were going to go into slavery? Let's see. Luke chapter 21. Luke 21, and we're going to pick it up at verse 20. Luke 21 and verse 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Jesus is referring to when Jerusalem was sieged by the Romans in 70 AD. All right. Notice what Jesus says is going to happen after that. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. And when many of the Israelites left from Jerusalem after this, where did they go? They went into Africa. And this wasn't the first time they went into Africa. You can read in the prophet Jeremiah's book, all right, when the Chaldeans came circa 600 BC and they took over Jerusalem and they took over Israel. Jeremiah tells you that the majority of the Israelites who were there at the time went where? Went into Egypt and went into Africa, okay? So this wasn't the first time. When the Assyrians took over, the northern kingdom before that, right? And they took the northern kingdom captive. When the Assyrians got knocked off, right? Where did the Assyrians and the Israelites go that they were their captives? Most of them went into Africa, okay? Verse 22, for these, for these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. When it says you're led away captive, that doesn't mean you immigrate. You immigrated there. That means you were taken there in slavery. That's what captive means. Okay. Captive means you're in captivity and shall be led away captive into all nations. Did it say here just America? No, it said all nations, right? That's why you have a transatlantic slave trade. You have a trans-Saharan slave trade, and you have an Arab slave trade or an Indian Ocean slave trade, right? Okay. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Last place we're going to look, Zephaniah 3, that old ebook goody scripture. Let's just confirm one more time that the Israelites went into sub-Saharan Africa and that the Bible tells you this as plain as day. Zephaniah chapter three, and we're gonna pick it up at verse eight. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, unto the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. This is talking about when Christ returns at his second coming and the battle of Armageddon. Verse nine, for then will I turn to the people of pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Because after the battle of Armageddon, Christ is gonna set up his kingdom here on earth and he's gonna rule for a thousand years. 
and everybody's going to worship him because they're going to have no choice and he's going to return to the people of pure language verse 10 from beyond the rivers of ethiopia my suppliants even the daughter of my dispersed shall bring mine offering so who is this the daughter of his dispersed these are the Israelites, right? Didn't he tell you he was going to disperse us into all nations? And where are these people going to go? Where do you, where will you find these people's roots at? From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. When you go beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, which this is referring to Cush or Moro, the ancient kingdom of Cush, the ancient kingdom of Moro, which was in modern day Sudan, North Sudan or modern day Sudan and South Sudan. When you go below Sudan, where are you? You are in sub-Saharan Africa or what they like to call Black Africa, okay? All right, we can stop there. So hopefully this was insightful to you. Shalom, join us for our Bible study on Friday. They're Friday night, 7 p.m. Central Time. We have our Sabbath class Saturdays at noon Central Time, and we'll be having our Feast of Unleavened Bread um, seventh day the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread lesson on Tuesday at noon, okay? Shalom.